So thanks for coming to this session. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jenkins and Chef and how we use those tools to provide continuous integration for our infrastructure code and automated deployment for our custom software applications. My name is Dan Stein, and I work for Copyright Clearance Center. Um, this is a little bit about me. If there's a theme running through my uh, career, it's really about finding, uh, removing, reducing inefficiency and inconsistency in the software development process um, in a variety of different, different roles. Um, Copyright Clearance Center, our headline is that we make uh, licensing solutions that make copyright work for everyone. Our customers uh, can get, share, and manage content in various settings of various types, uh, academic, corporate, print, digital. And software is a huge enabler for us. We have a, you know, the usual broad array of, of software systems that have grown up or, over the years. And um, three years ago, we <coughs> decided to adopt a product platform stra strategy to get our hands around um, the ever-increasing needs of the business, uh, expanding product lines, uh, larger volume of data, and try and really uh, build a much smoother conveyor belt from development through to production. Quick agenda, we'll, we'll provide some context uh, that, you know, that, we're, that we are operating at a high level. Um, maybe do a quick introduction to some of the non-Jenkins technologies um, that we used. Um, and then get into the key elements of our deployment process design and into the details of our cookbook build process and our application deployment process. So some context, like I said, three years ago, we started this platform effort. And you know, one of our highest guiding principles was to be homogenous by default. Let's pick a standard set of technologies, tools, processes, and use them. Um, you know, that doesn't mean we can't have variations, but they should, there should be a particular reason, not just because, well, somebody thought of this or thought of that. So these are the tools we, we picked, or well, some of the tools, um, Java, Tomcat, Postgres. And then on the, on the SCM side, most of these tools should be familiar. Um, Liquibase may be a bit, of an, a bit less common. That's a database schema migration uh, framework. And so we picked common tools, and then we instituted common process around them. We wanted a standard development workflow. Developers on their machines should have a common experience no matter which project they work on. And applications should have a common shape and profile. Um, they should be configured in a standard way. Logging should be done in a standard way. <clears throat> and uh, that helps developers and operations all through the, all through the pipeline. The initial delivery pipeline that we built looked like this. We had our source code in GitHub. We had Jenkins, the efficient, reliable butler, converting that source code into binary artifacts that we published to Artifactory. And then we deployed that on a wide array of machines grouped into various in environments. How did we do that? Well, we had this poor guy in IT operations doing it manually at our company. His name is Don. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe his name should be Brent. I, I don't know. Show of hands, who's read the Phoenix Project book? Definitely, definitely a few, but but some that that haven't. I'd recommend it. It's it's a work of fiction, but it's a real page turner. Uh, good beach reading this summer, and it's it's a novel about IT operations. I mean, not another one of those, I know, but <laughs> you know, I recommend it. It, it you know. I read it, and it's sort of like, oh, you know, this is this is our life. So, so we have we have Don in operations, and uh, his team, and they're 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 doing this manual development process. But we want to provide relief, so, you know, <coughs> that was the the key effort the key effort of the last year or so, and. We sort of talked about this. We're publishing artifacts to Artifactory. We take the liquid-based scripts as well as the applications, and we version those, and we put those into Artifactory so they're ready for deployment as well. And yeah, many applications, many versions, many times, many environments, it really all adds up. Um, so we had a huge, uh, a huge opportunity. <coughs> so our deployment process, we want to you know, sort of do the usual improvements, speed, reliability, frequency. Um, we wanted to enable self-service, plan for that, design a framework where 
you know, sure, we can help developers deploy to the development environment and operations deploy to other environments, but over time, let the QA staff deploy to their test environments themselves instead of going through intermediaries. And so we do that by automating and then <coughs> um, adopting the principles of infrastructure as code. So going from a process where a development team, tech lead writes a, a Word document may, maybe with some diagrams, illustrating how to install and configure the software. Um, it gets out of date over time. We want to move to capturing that configuration as code and uh, taking that document, putting a lot of it into code, and then what's left behind is higher value operational stuff, how to tune it in various conditions or um, uh, in response to various needs. So our target delivery pipeline that we selected looked like this. All the same, but um, up in the corner, we've got Jenkins again as a deployment coordinator now as well, and Chef running on the various machines to install and configure applications. Um, Jenkins was a natural choice for us. We're already using it, so we're familiar with it. In addition to its uh, strengths uh, alone of being flexible, open source, a good community, Chef had those same things, other than the fact that we weren't familiar with it, we hadn't used it. <coughs> so, I guess another show of hands, who, who's, who had heard of Chef before today? Excellent. How many Chef users do we have? Fewer. <laughs> um, Puppet users, okay, about the same amount. So um, not, not coming out of nowhere, but not as much hands on. So quick, we'll, we'll go through this sort of quickly, but so we can understand the rest of the talk. Um, <clears throat> first, when we talk about managing Computer systems, we can think in three basic layers that aren't perfectly separated from each other, but working from the, bound, uh, the bottom up, we have provisioning, that's you know, getting a machine, which is done generally in a virtual way these days through a hypervisor. Then the next layer up is taking that machine and installing and configuring all the software on it that's, that's supposed to be there. And then the top layer is orchestration, having those machines work together to provide value to the business um, in a distributed fashion. <coughs> the, the uh, tool chef um, and this talk will talk right in that middle middle layer there, the configuration layer. Infrastructure as code, we talked about this a little bit already, but basically it's recognizing that our infrastructure is almost completely programmable at this point, effectively 100%. So let's recognize that, acknowledge it, and write actual programs to manage it. Sure, we've written shell scripts before here and there. Maybe we've managed them in certain ways, but let's you know pick up and move to a new new world where we use the same principles that we've been using to build our software applications to manage our software infrastructure. And that's things like using source code and version control so that we can get benefits like sharing and collaboration um, and history, using modularity and abstraction to get reuse and uh, efficiency and our application code, you know, we test the heck out of it. We, you know, do static analysis. We do unit testing, integration testing, acceptance testing. Well, let's apply uh, serious testing to our infrastructure code as well. And the third general point uh, concept is configuration management. That's a, a field from at least the 1950s, um, not specific for software systems, but has been applied to software systems in the last couple decades, CF Engine uh, was created back in the 90s. Puppet and Chef are much newer um, and have learned from you know, the history of the other tools. And there's, there's other examples like Salt and Ansible that are even more uh, recent additions. And these, are, these tools let us apply these infrastructure as code principles. They let us write source code. They have an ecosystem around them to help test and uh, <coughs> provide modularity and abstraction and the things we talked about. Um, and another point is that these tools are often declarative. Um, so instead of saying, do this, we say, ensure that this is true. So it's maybe a subtle difference, but basically we say, ensure that the machine looks like this. And each time we run the tool, make a test. And if it's not, take a corrective action. And if not, do nothing. So it's not about you know, do an action, it's about Ensure that this is always true. Do it and keep it that way. <coughs> so we get to Chef, a configuration management tool that we selected. This one, uh, 
Chef exposes a domain-specific language hosted within Ruby, and that gives us our uh, declarative uh, clean syntax and lets us <coughs> express the what, not the how, at the level, at the you know sort of everyday level. And um, but by virtue of being hosted as an internal DSL within Ruby, we do have the opportunity, if if need be, to write arbitrary Ruby code to get a certain job done. Um, it's not necessarily, it's often perhaps not the best way. You should do it in a declarative fashion, but you know, like with Git, you can create just about any workflow you want. Um, I prefer tools that you know, don't box you in and, and you, you have flexibility when and if you need it. So Chef terminology that we'll be using in this talk. Chef client is the software that's installed on the individual nodes, which are the machines under management and those nodes are registered with the Chef server in a central fashion. The developers write code on workstations and use tools such as Knife to interact with the server. Chef models the node configuration as a set of resources. These are things like packages that should be installed, services that should be running, and those resources are mapped to implementations called providers. That's the actual code to execute, and that's the code that would actually do a test and take an action if, if necessary. And a key point is that while Chef comes with a set of core built-in resources, like directories and packages, uh, it is very easy to define custom resources. And we'll see you know, an example later of, of our core custom resource. Here's one of the built-in resource declarations. This just says, you know, be sure to you know, ensure that directory C inside of directory B, inside of A, exists on the file system with these permissions, this owner, so on and so forth. You know, it's actually kind of verbose compared to the make dir command that you don't see, you know, that happens behind the scenes. Um, but, you know, so it's not exactly a good example of conciseness, but uh, when you define a custom resource, you can have all kinds of actions happening behind the scenes, potentially still from a small number of declarative lines, and we'll, and we'll see, that, see that later. Last set of chef terminology is recipes declare a set of resources with their desired configuration. Recipes, of course, we collect into cookbooks. So cookbooks are uh, the fundamental unit of distribution for the chef code. And that's just like a jar file is the unit of distribution for Java code. Um, chef has data bags, which hold JSON formatted information that can be used by the chef codes. And uh, chef code, and those are uh, contain data bag items. And Chef has a concept of an environment which model the deployed environments that you're, you're managing. Each node then has what's called a run list that lists out all the recipes that should be applied to that node every time Chef runs. So that's, basic, that's the basics of Chef for, for anyone who, who didn't have that baseline. Um, there's a lot more to Chef, but at the same time, we can sort of run through it pretty quickly like this and uh, be able to have a discussion. So we can move on to the key elements of our deployment process that, that we wanted to design in. So fundamentally, like we basically saw in the picture before, we want to deploy our custom applications with Chef, install them, configuration, configure them, generate a, a configuration file, and uh, we want to run our schema updates for the database underneath with Liquibase, and we chose Jenkins to coordinate that whole process. So, uh, we chose Jenkins because we're familiar with it, and it's definitely built as a general purpose job executor. Sure, it started as a build tool, but Kosuke built it in a much more generic way. We use shell scripts uh, steps for the Chef API at this time, and Gradle steps for Liquibase updates. And we have the ability, in the same way, you know, like when we talked about the Ruby DSL and the arbitrary code, we can insert arbitrary steps at any point in our job if we need them. Um, we don't do it often, but it's, not, it's a nice feature to have. The UI, it's great to see that there's a refresh coming, but it exists, it, uh, and it <clears throat> integrates very smoothly with Active Directory. Um, I've integrated a number of tools with it. This was easily the cleanest uh, integration I've had, and it provides the key authentication authorization that we need as we talk about a pipeline of environments leading all the way to including production. And for administration, it was great because we already administer our build server, we can use all the same uh, techniques for our deploy server. So then we, we talk about deploying applications, but well, what, what is an application? We use that 
term to mean different things in different contexts. We might really mean a system, you know, an order management system, but it has multiple individual applications that uh, comprise it. So we defined a term application group um, so that when we sort of build our infrastructure, we can have a clearer definition. So an application is an individual single deployable unit, you know, the UI, a REST service, and then a group is these things grouped together. And a key notion about a group is that it's versioned and released all together, built with a single command at a single time, um, and then the framework we built allows us to deploy it with a single command as well. On the technical side, so we think about a framework that we're building to do deployments, um, and then it's gonna be consumed by many of these application groups. And so we need some kind of interface for those application groups to use the framework. And we wanted to have a nice, clean, tight, narrow API there <coughs> um, to facilitate that, you know, the, 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 the clients using the framework. <coughs> and so that's the Chef custom resource that, that we've, we've mentioned and, and we'll show that's the, that's the interface. And um, we were able to boil it down pretty far so that only the essential differences between apps are there. And you know that makes it both easier to consume the framework and also makes standards easier to happen. If we don't let you decide where to install Java on a machine, it'll always go in the standard location. Same with Tomcat and so on. <clears throat> we wanted to strike a balance between consistency and flexibility. So you know we're writing install guides. We're going to turn that into versioned cookbooks. Um, you know so that the instructions we can you know refer to them in a you know with a handle and you know a version. Um, but at the same time, we need to use those cookbooks down a pipeline in uh, different environments, and so they need to be parameterized, and that's where the configuration in the data bags comes in, um, and we'll see you know, this concretely later. Um, but so that's sort of the consistency of the cookbook version and uh, the parameterization of the data bags coming in. And the last thing I wanted to mention here is as applications move down the pipeline, dev, test, to production. Uh, the cookbooks need to move along too, but they need to do it in a controlled fashion, just like the applications do. So we don't want to build a new version of the cookbook and all of a sudden have it take effect in production. We want to test it in dev and in the pipeline along the way. And so we use the chef environment uh, concept allows us to uh, specify version constraints on cookbooks, which will help gate, you know, the cookbooks as they move along, update the version constraint to let a new cookbook apply to an environment. We end up with two basic cookbook types, <coughs> library cookbooks, you know, like Java libraries, they enc encapsulate common reusable logic, um, and that's where we actually define the custom resource that all the application groups will use and the implementation of it as well. Then the application cookbooks sit above that, and we have one cookbook for each of these application groups, and within it, one recipe, recipe per ap individual application. And as we've talked about, those end up being pretty lightweight because we've boiled it down pretty well and you just specify the essential differences of your app. <coughs> so in the data bags, we're <coughs> we have the application configuration. We have you know, items per environment. So that's where you can specify, you know, in this environment, uh, we depend on the foo service that's located on the test server or the foo service that's located on a production server, we have that variability. Um, we can have different Java options as we go down the pipeline. If you're gonna do a stress test environment, maybe you wanna bump the heap size. You know, we don't know, it sort of depends. So we have a data bag per application group, the same way we have a cookbook per application group and one of these data bag items, which we'll look at a concrete example of for each environment. And in contrast to the cookbooks, which are versioned, the data bags are more or less live. Basically, you want to make a change to the app in this environment. You edit the data bag, commit it to source control, run, run a deploy, push it to the chef server, and it takes effect right away. So we're still capturing our configuration as code, um, but it's not sort of versioned in the same way um, as a cookbook. Right here, we have an example of the actual usage of our custom resource. So we see that it's only about 12 lines. In the upper left there, CCC web app, you know, that's, our, that's the name of our custom resource. We've extended the DSL in the, in the way that Chef makes very easy. And it says make sure that the UI for the My App group is deployed. And so what is it, what is, you know, what, what's unique about this app? Well, we need to give it the artifact group and name so the process can reach into Artifactory and retrieve it. 
We need to tell it the name of the Tomcat container it should run in, what port it should run on, um, and we need to tell it information about the properties file it needs, what, what kind of template should it use when it substitutes in the data bag values, and that's really it. Everything else is standardized and happens you know, each time, but in a standard way and doesn't need to be called out here. So what happens under the covers, you know, when you run this? Well, it retrieves Java, Tomcat, and the war file from Artifactory, it installs them in a standard location, creates the container, installs the war, you know, opens the port in the host firewall, generates the properties file, and starts the container. You know, so this is, you're getting much more bang for your buck. The directory resource was a bunch of lines for maybe a make dir command. Here, you've got 10 or 12 lines, and all that's happening. And in fact, it's happening, or it's not, on a repeated deploy, we're not gonna download the same version of Java again and reinstall it you know, uh, only if we upgrade the version. So it's, it's smart in that fashion. So here's a concrete example of the data bag structure. The uh, data bag is named my app, that's the group, and then you sort of see dev, test, and prod are our environments, so there's a, there's a file for each of those, and it says, so in the dev environment, we have version 1.4.9, and use these particular Java ops and these application configuration uh, properties. You know, this is where the database is in the dev environment. It'll be different in the test environment. And that gets used at deploy time. It gets mashed together and generates a properties file from a template. This slide I included just sort of for, for reading later on. I don't think it's worth sort of digging through the syntax in detail, but if, you know, somebody wants to try implementing this, this is, this is some detail about, about how we did it. Um, then the final sort of design element we had was what are the roles we're trying to support here? Um, and it's sort of a hierarchical uh, set here. So at the top we have deployers. They're sort of the most casual participants here. They know how to update these data bags and these environment files if necessary to promote a cookbook and how to press the button in Jenkins to initiate a deployment. <clears throat> Going one step beyond that are the tech leads. They over time need to learn to maintain their application cookbooks in the same way that they need to uh, you know, maybe describe how to, to operations, how to deploy their app. Well, they can do that through code now. You know, ed edit the application cookbook as necessary. And then the core is the framework developers and you know, they're responsible for maintaining the library cookbooks, answering questions, generally maintaining the framework in the process. Um, so each, each layer here knows how to do all the roles above. Um, and then you can see how deployers, you know, over time, you know, you might have uh, QA staff or non-tech leads who may not know the details, but, you know, could do a deployment if necessary. So we've got this infrastructure code, um, and we want to apply uh, standard testing processes to it. How do we do that? Well, we need to build process for our cookbooks. And it looks like this. We uh, have the code in, in, at GitHub and in a pretty standard process in the Jenkins uh, build server, we have a CI job that, that as soon as changes are noticed, picks up and runs, runs our tests and we'll, we'll go through the details of really what that means. But it includes you know, truly spinning up uh, ephemeral nodes at EC2, spin them up, run the recipes, configure the configure the instances, test, test that uh, what should have happened did indeed happen, and, uh, and then throw them away. And the release job is very similar, just like with application jobs, but you know, in this case, you know, publication means uh, not put, you know, in the application world, publication, you push it to Artifactory here, you push the cookbook to the chef server so it's ready for, for runs of deploys. So we created you know, um, these jobs for each of the application groups that we have, um, consuming the framework, and we put them on the same builds, mast, builds Jenkins master as we do for the application builds. Again, trying to reinforce the principle that you know, the tech leads have responsibility, yes, for the application build and release process, but over time, also for the cookbooks. So one-stop shopping in one master. Um, we did need a new class of slaves with the Ruby and Chef ecosystem tools installed uh, as opposed to our Java slaves for application build jobs. So the cookbook CI job runs when new code is merged. 
in the Java world, we have tools like CheckStyle and FindBugs to do static analysis. Well, we have, you know, corresponding tools in the Chef and Ruby ecosystem. We can check the JSON syntax. We can check the Ruby syntax. Um, we can use tools uh, like uh, to check in Chef specific syntax, Food Critic. Um, you know, the Chef. When you name a tool Chef, it permits a wide variety of uh, names to. For, for tools that grow up around in the ecosystem. Um, so that's one I like, Food Critic. And then for integration testing, sure, Test Kitchen, why not? And you know, we use the EC2 driver for that. There's an array of drivers for different cloud providers, um, but that's how we spin up nodes. So what does that integration test lifecycle look like? Let's dive in a little bit more. Um, we spin up EC2 instance, instances for the application group. We tested the application group level. So maybe there's a UI and a REST service, um, maybe a message processor. And if they're supposed to be deployed on three separate instances in the real deployed environments, we spin up three separate EC2 instances and configure them and, and test them. Um, if some other application uh, group says things are co-located on a server, well, we put them both on the same server and you know they better be running on different ports, that kind of thing. Um, so we run Chef on each of those nodes. We make our asserts just like we would in a unit test or an integration test. Is this service running? Is this directory created? Is, is, uh, is, an, is the correct, are we getting the correct response when we uh, make an HTTP, requ HTTP request to this particular port um, and so on? And once we run through all that, we, we throw away the instances and they were alive for eight, 10 minutes depending. Um, and you know, we, have our, we have our test results. A little more detail, we're creating those instances from a base AMI that is pre-configured with Ruby and Chef so we, don't, we aren't installing that every time we spin up one of these machines. We are installing uh, the application every time, sort of by definition, that's what we're trying to test, but not, not some of the baseline stuff. Um, we use the mode of Chef called Chef Solo. So when, in our deployed environments, we use the client-server model that, that we talked about in the terminology slides, but um, that would just add overhead in this case. The value of a Chef server is you know, being able to have a uh, list of all the nodes under management, uh, run reports across them over time, and you know, that really, you know, that, that's no benefit here and it's just overhead, so we, so we don't do that. Um, <clears throat> we talked about using Chef environments. Well, you know, we have the Chef environments defined for our, our pipeline you know, that exists in reality. Well, we create a fake one called Chef Dev for our testing purposes. So if we want to tweak parameters or uh, try something out, you know, it's completely divorced from the live configuration of the real environments. We tag our EC2 instances for traceability. You know, in an EC2 account, we have lots of production and other kinds of instances in there. Um, we want to know, you know, which ones are the Chef ones, the, the Chef Dev ones, so that uh, if something's going wrong or it's been orphaned, we can, we can easily know that we could get rid of it. Um, and you know, normally, like with an application build, you might, if something goes wrong, you might just be able to tell from the build log what, what the problem is, or you might need to try it, or you can run Test Kitchen from your workstation. It would spin up new nodes, but they wouldn't get thrown away right away. You can SSH in, look around, try and figure out why it's not behaving properly. We have a cookbook release job, like we said, does basically the same stuff, but it uploads the cookbook version and uh, tags the Git repo, just like we would for an application build. So. That's sort of all set up, maybe an appetizer for our main course, which is application deployment. That process looks like this. We created a new uh, Jenkins master, a deploy server here. <coughs> um, the, we, we still pull code in live from GitHub because that's the sort of live configuration that comes from the data bags and environments. We push them up to the Chef server, and then we, we run the Chef client on uh, our deployed nodes either EC2, VMware, or both. We have a, uh, a hybrid cloud environment at our company, um, so VMware on-premise and, and EC2 in the cloud, and you know, pull the artifacts from Artifactory. So <clears throat> the deploy server, we talked about that. The slaves need the same Ruby and Chef stuff, but in this case, they now also need the SSH keys for those actual uh, deployed nodes. The deploy job types, Right now we have two for each app group. One is the dev deploy job that developers use to deploy to their development environment, and then a non-dev job. There's, I don't, there's 
don't have a better name for that, that operations uses to deploy to the rest of the pipeline beyond uh, dev. But that can easily be extended over time to create a QA job or a test job for people you know, in the middle to deploy, deploy in the middle. So the job parameters, you might need to select the environment if it's a non-dev job, and otherwise you put in the application group version and, and hit go. We <coughs> use that to cross-check against the data bag version. Um, you know, this is basically a, a fail-safe to make sure that you're deploying the right way, the, deploying the version you want, and that it's captured in the data bag. If we only had it in the data bag, then <coughs> um, you might not, uh, you might forget to update the data bag and not really notice it, but if you have to enter it right there in the UI, you know, it's much less likely that you're gonna deploy the wrong version. So what does a deployer do? What does it boil down? That top, that top role that's sort of the, the lightweight role uh, they need to make the configuration changes. If they need to edit the data bag item, it's time to go from version 1.4.8 to 1.4.9. That may be all they need to do. Maybe they need to promote a cookbook if there was some change. And they merge that code and, and execute the job in Jenkins. So what does that look, you know, what's an example of that? We just sort of said here, uh, you know, the example here is doing 1.4.9 to the test environment and the automation takes over from there, uploads various files. It does a search against the chef server. So it says, I'm trying to do application group my app and in the test environment. So I can run a search against the chef server to say, in the test environment, what nodes uh, have recipes for the my app group? And it should return you know, the server that has the UI, the server that has the REST service, and so on. And then we just iterate through those and trigger chef client on each node. Um, you know, we fail or succeed and send email notification to the appropriate folks, and you know, the deploy is complete. <clears throat> so you know, that's sort of the, you know, we've talked, as we designed this process, we were sort of saying, okay, well, you know, the, the, the nirvana we want is that push button deploy. And you know, so this is a picture of our current push button deploy button. Um, the top one is the dev, dev job that runs. Um, in the development environment, so you just have to put in the version. And then the second one is the one that handles all the rest of the environments down the pipeline. And uh, you know, so you have to select an environment as well. And then you hit go. Here's some history of running these real jobs. These are, the, the, you know, these are, these are real screenshots from, from this in use. And on the left is that dev job again. So the build description is, is set to the same environment every time. But you see the, hopefully you can read that. Um, you can see the version that's getting deployed varying over time, um, going back and forth a little, but you know, generally creeping upwards. And on the right is the history of the non-dev job. And so we see different environments popping up in here along with different versions as things move along the pipeline. And so you know, one of the powerful things about this is from the start, at the start of the pipeline in the dev environment, we're using our standard process to do the deployment. And this is in contrast to over the years where, you know, developers just sort of log into the box, put the machine on there, start and stop Tomcat, maybe edit a properties file, and then sort of try and write it down later and uh, hand that off down the line. Well, now we're using, you know, a standard process. They have to edit the cookbook, get everything configured properly. Maybe they have to iterate a bit in dev to get it working. And then the handoff is, you know, just use this cookbook version and it flows right down the pipeline. Um, and this is an example of you know, what I've heard referred to as shifting quality left. So you know, the spectrum as time goes on, you know, changes go from development to test to production, you know, left to right, and you, know, you wanna find errors as far to the left as possible. Um, you know, we talked about that with application development, the earlier you find a bug, the cheaper it is to fix. The same is true in, in uh, infrastructure as code. And so this is, this is an example of that. Um, and, you know, manifestation is, uh, you know, operation staff gets to spend less time on it. The development staff gets to uh, spend less time on the deploys because the operation team doesn't have to come back to them to say, did you forget a step when you told me what to do? And the QA staff spends less time waiting around for the new deploy of the app that they want to test. So some final thoughts, um, you know, the caveat is, <clears throat> you know, don't, don't take what anybody says as, as gospel, uh, you know, best practices is a loaded word, 
you know, listen to a lot of points of view, listen to talks, read articles, read books, and you know, then apply that to your context and your organization and your team and create a solution that works for you. So I will, having said that, you know, share some things that worked for us. So we talked about standardization. That's been huge for us. Um, you know, in a number of ways, standardize as much as we can. We really did achieve economies of scale here. Once we had deployed the first one or two application groups with our framework, they started toppling like dominoes because of all that work we had put in starting three years ago to define a standard build process, a standard shape for applications. Um, we really saw it happen, and it was, it was actually you know, exciting to see. <clears throat> um, one another principle we have is that every tool we add to our inf infrastructure must have an API. Um, we need to be able to glue things together, get information out of one system and pass it to another, or run, you know, execute queries. Um, we may have to trade off some out-of-the-box capabilities for that, but um, the idea is that we'll avoid hitting a wall down the road where, oh, well, you know, we just can't get at that information, or, you know, it's in there, but I can only, like, uh, read the GUI or screen scrape the GUI or something. We, you know, that's where we need to stay away. It, that's what we need to avoid. Um, we used multiple communication paths as we rolled this process out. And I mean, we've been rolling it out for about six months, but um, you know, it's still going. Different kinds of meetings, large meetings, small meetings, one-on-ones. We wrote documentation for the couple people who read it. Um, Though, in the end, documentation truly has, has worked well for us. Um, we have distributed team, different time zones. Um, you know, face-to-face -to -face is not always helpful. Documentation um, it, so is useful for, for that. Different people have different learning modes. And it helped our design process. You know, you write something down on paper, you draw a diagram, and maybe you discover a solution to something you'd been trying to figure out or, or a, a problem becomes sort of obvious in, you know, in, when you draw it out that you, hadn't, that you hadn't realized. So documentation's actually been quite important. And we had to be opportunistic. Um, we, maybe we didn't have to be, but we were, and it worked out very well. Um, you know, we had sort of said, okay, well, what app should we do first? And we sort of talked to management and this and that, and you know, selected a couple candidates, started working on them, but then you know, maybe they got busy. Um, <clears throat> And we went with another app that was ready in their sprint cycle. Maybe they were doing well against their plans and they could work with it. Um, and it also depends, you know, project to project. Not all tech leads are the same. Some are more motivated, more interested to try out new things. You know, find your early adopters and, uh, you know, bring them along and make them part of your team. Just like with application development, we had to balance uh, process and progress. We needed to deliver results, but not, you know, hurriedly mash things together and leave ourselves a mess. Um, you know, just like you can't refactor, you know, three sprints in a row when doing application development. Um, you need to strike a balance. And it worked really well for us to start with this big pain point, all this time and effort gone to doing deploys. It builds credibility for our overall infrastructure effort and, you know, hopefully we'll be recouping bandwidth that we can reinvest in other maybe less obvious pain points. Um, you know, sometimes we get the question, when will you be done? That's probably, you know, a typical thing. And, you know, done is a dangerous word. Um, it's a four-letter word. <laughs> the, the business isn't going to stop, so the application development isn't going to stop, and the infrastructure development doesn't need to stop. Um, you know, that's, the, the more hops you make away from the business doesn't stop, the harder it is to communicate that, but, um, we need, to, we need to do it, we need to try, um, because it's, it's the truth. Um, you know, so in the end, you know, we're on a journey. We're not getting to a particular destination. There's certainly milestones and big milestones along the way, but you know, we're not just gonna get somewhere and be happy um, with no further work to do. Um, and that, that holds for deployment automation, continuous delivery, you know, many different things. Um, and that's really what I had prepared. Um, I'd like to... Uh, thank uh, our company for the manifold support that they provided us in this effort uh, to date and, and in the future, and thank uh, all my fantastic colleagues at the Copyright Clearance Center engineering team who've uh, been great in pulling this together. And uh, I'd like to thank the JUC organizers and sponsors for uh, bringing us all together today. Um, thank you. <laughs>